Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Sagan and Six. I want to do my own political roundup now, if I could. Uh, John McTishan was excellent at giving us uh, a view of what he thinks is happening, both uh, provincially, federally, as well as some thoughts uh, municipally. And I thought it was a good discussion. So now it's my turn, uh, if I could, uh, to uh, to give you a couple of points um, off the top. And I'm not going to go into this in detail because I'm going to do a whole show on this uh, in a little while. But in regards to what's going on in Israel uh, right now, I, I want to say there's never in my mind an excuse for terrorism and evil barbarism. And I think over the weekend, I've had several conversations with people on different sides of of, of the, the issues in regards to um, the treatment of uh, Palestinians um, and, uh, and, and the current political situation uh, or the past, I should say, political situation in Israel. Um, and I think even if you ever had some sympathies for the Palestinian uh, predicament, given what's happened with uh, Hamas, given the barbarism, given the terror, given the, the, the just unspeakable evil that has been um, that we've seen in the last couple of days. I think that uh, what Hamas has um, has created is a situation where any kind of sympathy or understanding uh, or, or sympathy uh, for Palestinian cause is going to be diminished dramatically. And I think that any kind of division within Israel is going to be unified dramatically. And so Hamas actually did the worst possible thing they could for the Palestinian cause. And I think that uh, the atrocities that we have seen are going to lose them incredible support and completely justifiably because anyone, any group that that does what we have seen at the music festival in kibbutzes, uh, in homes, doesn't deserve our support, for sure. Doesn't deserve our sympathy, for sure. Deserves to be treated like the war criminals they are. Uh, and I'm not saying this is all of the, all Palestinians for sure, but I'm certainly saying this is Hamas. And uh, I think Hamas has uh, done an unbelievable disservice um, to uh, to their people, uh, to Palestinians. And, um, and I will support Israel in combating this evil like evil deserves to be combated. Anyway, enough on that for now, um, because frankly, I've been glued to the TV uh, for the last couple of days watching what's going on, as probably lots of you have as well. Uh, but to Canadian politics, I think that uh, John uh, was really interesting in his assessment of Premier Ford, uh, the Premier of Ontario, and his ability to come back from this green belt debacle. And I think it really truly is a debacle. Um, and as long as it doesn't go into corruption, as long as Ford is not guilty of corruption, um, and I'm not suggesting he is, but I'm saying there's a possibility clearly that he's found to be. Um, and so everything I'm saying is predicated on, on the assumption that he isn't corrupt and he is not found guilty of corruption. And so the worst is, is bad management and a really bad uh, strategy. Bad management is the should have had far better review of his cabinet ministers and certainly uh, some of the the people working for his cabinet ministers. I think John's right. I think that uh, Ford can come back. Remember in the in the first uh, Ford um, mandate, uh, he did some really stupid things uh, in in the first uh, couple of months after he was uh, initially elected. And Trudeau, uh, Justin Trudeau, effectively ran against Ford in his. Uh, big campaign in, in 2019, I think it was, the fall of, and uh, and won, um, running against Ford, effectively, and uh, and some of his policies. But then during COVID, Ford surprised, I think, a lot of people uh, and was a lot more moderate, a lot more reasonable, um, was supportive of, of science, um, did his press conferences almost a daily basis, and I think garnered a lot of support. And I think a lot of the the other than his uh, his abdication of any kind of uh, responsibility for the trucker uh, convoy uh, and and uh, occupation of Ottawa, I think he did a very good 
capable job, and he got rewarded uh, with that. Uh, it helped that he was running against some pretty uh, uh, weak uh, leaders for the opposition parties. So I agree with John. Three years is a long time in politics, and he can probably come back. Um, that said, I also think that the housing policies that have been in the forefront of his campaign so far, other than the green belt, I think have been the right policies. And so therefore, if he says, you know what, I messed up here and I went too far and it was wrong and I should never have broken that pledge uh, that I made to uh, to not breach the green belt, but major increase in housing, increased in density around transit zones, um, uh, as of right uh, opportunities to, to build uh, uh, housing, et cetera, getting rid of development fees, um, getting rid of... Uh, of the the regulations in local governments that uh, inhibit uh, housing development, all are I think really good strategies. And frankly, the most action that we've had on our housing issue in forever. And so I think that if he continues to focus on that, and and clearly what he did with the green belt was wrong, but almost explain it as trying to go too far, um, and trying to do too much. Um, and uh, and airing um, on on to, wanting too much land for development, um, I don't think he'll be uh, ever justified in breaching his promise on the green belt. But I think he might be forgiven um, because I do think that the apology was heartfelt and uh, and clearly the process was wrong. So that's uh, that's number one. Um, I do think that transit is another big issue. Uh, this delay of the Eglinton cross town is a terrible problem. It was started under previous government, not his, and so therefore I think he's able to to uh, to to potentially put some blame on prior liberal government. But that said, you know if if competence and and business experience and and uh, fiscal prudence are hallmarks of what uh, uh, Premier Ford wants to stand for, this mess of the Edmonton Crosstown um, and, uh, and and frankly, some of the other LRTs, Ottawa, um, that is, uh, you know, broken down and having problems and Hamilton that's not even getting off the ground. Uh, I think he's got to focus in on transit and build the transit that we need um, in, in Ontario. And if he does all that, solves the housing issue and solves the transit issue, that's a pretty mighty... Uh, um, hill for him to climb. But if he does that or works hard at trying to do that, I think he uh, has got a good chance of winning the next election. On federal politics, um, Pierre Polyev is pretty impressive. I think his politics are too right wing. I think they're too extreme. I don't agree with them. Uh, I think that uh, he has become beholden to uh, uh, anti-vaxxers and, uh, and people that were part of the, the trucker convoy and uh, the social conservatives. But He's doing a reasonably good job of staying away from those issues and focusing on pocketbook issues, making Justin Trudeau the blame for a lot of those issues, even though it's not justified and uh, and 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 it you know worldwide problems with inflation and worldwide problems with the economy and worldwide problems with deficits, uh, and so uh, you know saying it's just inflation is completely wrong, but it's resonating with people. I recently spent uh, a couple of days on business out in Saskatchewan and uh, and uh, Alberta. And I shouldn't be shocked, but I was shocked by how resentful the West is of Justin Trudeau, how um, they feel completely hard done by uh, carbon taxes and uh, and energy strategies, uh, and how they feel that uh, you know we've got this incredible resource um, potential uh, opportunity in Saskatchewan and Alberta, and we're squandering it. Um, and you know, a lot of them are very aware of and agree with climate change, um, greenhouse gases, uh, et cetera. But they just want to use hydrocarbons um, as a way of of solving the problem um, by treating them at source um, to turn them into hydrogen or ammonia uh, or do carbon capture or, you know, numerous other things that uh, there's technology today to uh, to diminish, if not completely eliminate, the carbon content of uh, of of the energy, but they still think that energy from uh, our vast resources is something that we should be focused on, and they feel as if uh, Ottawa or some people in Ottawa are completely against that. 
and uh, and and this feeling is is a visceral feeling of uh, of not hatred, but that that people in Ottawa within the Liberal Party um, and within uh, Trudeau's cabinet just don't care about Albertans. And I'm not saying that's true, um, but that's a perception. And uh, it's a perception I heard at a couple different meetings and a couple different lunches and a couple different dinners. And so I think it's a, it's a real big issue that uh, Trudeau needs to, uh, to address. Uh, and so I think that if Trudeau, if Justin Trudeau and the Liberal Party don't do something in regards to, uh, to diminishing their over-focus on climate change and carbon taxes without acknowledging the reality that we're not going to move away from hydrocarbons that quickly. And so therefore, the resources that we have uh, play a hugely important role in, 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 in growth and prosperity and solving our energy problem. We just have to clean it up effectively rather than not use it at all. Um, and we need to see the resources that we have in the West as an incredible patrimony, uh, an incredible resource, an incredible asset that Canada has and come forward with an infrastructure plan and a resource extraction plan and a resource exploitation plan that uh, is uh, consistent with that kind of an attitude. If the Trudeau government doesn't do that, I worry that, uh, not worry, I think that uh, they're going to win urban Toronto, but they're certainly not going to win the West. They're certainly not going to win uh, rural Ontario, um, Quebec, etc. And they risk losing suburban Ontario, the 905. And uh, that would be death knell for the Liberal Party. And I think Pierre Polyev is doing, I don't agree with him um, or a lot of his policies. I've said that, but I think he's doing a good job. And uh, and and the Liberal Party has, has not yet uh, gone out and labeled him the way they could have. So maybe they're holding their cards uh, close to their vest and, and waiting for the right time to use it. But I worry that they're waiting too long. And uh, Pierre Polyev is going to have met too many people, spoken to too many people, gone to too many rallies, exposed to too many people, people that I meet in everyday uh, business life and, and social life that are really quite impressed with uh, Pierre Polyev. I also want to talk about municipal politics uh, for a second, if I could. I do think that one of the, not benefits, but impacts of this uh, focus on housing overregulation has been a realization that I think a lot of people have come to that our municipal politicians have not been doing a good job. They've been getting elected because they've been catering to the loudest voices in our community, but they actually haven't been doing right by their citizens and by their uh, their cities. And I'm not saying that's every politician, every municipal politician, but the fact that 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 according to numerous different studies, um, you know, Canada, Ontario, et cetera, are the worst places, the hardest places to get housing, to get developments approved, and that we've got um, some of the most expensive housing relative to incomes. And that, uh, you know, I think that most young people don't have a hope in blank of being able to afford a home. That that dream, that Canadian dream of home ownership, a, a suburban home with a pool in the backyard has been robbed, has been robbed from the next generation. And it's primarily by over-regulation, red tape, time to get approvals, development fees, et cetera, put in place by local municipal politicians. And the government has said that, the Housing Affordability Task Force has said that, BUILD has said that, CMHC has said that, study after study, stats can in their study said that. And so I think that people are gonna hopefully come to the realization that we actually need to to elect some municipal politicians that are actually worried about the future of their cities and the future of the future constituents in their cities and the young people in their cities, not just with the loud voices that don't want anything in their backyard. And so I think that we are set for some pretty profound change in Canada. Not sure about prov provincial, but federal, I, I think there's gonna be change. And municipal, I think there's gonna be a lot of change. And I think that the provincial government right now, if they continue to implement some of the things that they're trying to implement in housing, may not be a government change, but it's going to be a lot of policy change, more more policy change than we've had in a long, long time. Anyway, that's my political roundtable for my dinner table conversations over this Thanksgiving weekend. I hope you had fun dinner table discussions as well. Good night, everybody. Thanks for joining. I remind you, I'm on every Monday through Friday at 6 o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online every night 
uh, at saga960am.ca. All my podcasts and videocasts are available on my website, briancrombie.com.